This UCSD TV program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest programs. The Sam and Rose Stein Institute for Research on Aging is committed to advancing lifelong health and well-being through research, professional training, patient care, and community service. As a nonprofit organization at the University of California San Diego School of Medicine, our research and educational outreach activities are made possible by the generosity of private donors. It is our vision that successful aging will be an achievable goal for everyone. To learn more, please visit our website at aging.ucsd.edu. Uh, this is my disclosure slide. I want to assure you all that I have no uh, engagement with any entity or person that I think in any way would have biased the content of what I'm going to be sharing with you this evening. Well, key point number one, and I, I got a sense that I'm kind of preaching to the choir here, but I will say that old people regularly enjoy and benefit from physical intimacy. And although I think this audience understands that, fairly well, uh, I am still aware that folks much younger than I don't necessarily have that concept uh, well understood. For many people, emotional intimacy is important for a satisfying sexual relationship. We know that there are other conditions that can also contribute to a satisfying sexual relationship, including safety, comfort, attraction, feeling secure about oneself, and feeling positively about the relationship, having a good image, a good self-image, and actually also having the ability to adequately communicate. Some about general things, because general communication is what helps us establish intimacy, but also specifically to be able to communicate about what it is that you're hoping for in terms of the intimate experience, and what it is that you're really not hoping for. And to be able to share that is really an important ingredient to having a good uh, intimate experience. Well, we know that older individuals display a spectrum of preferences and adaptations and that there is no one right answer for everyone, especially if someone has a partner who's living with dementia illness. My bias is that for healthcare professionals, and perhaps for friends and loved ones as well, our most important responsibilities are to introduce the topic and to facilitate open, supportive dialogue. I do not want anyone in this room to think that I have anything prescriptive to offer tonight. It really isn't that I'm advocating any particular behavior or um, lifestyle. What I am hopeful about is that we can all continue a journey that leads us to increased comfort about talking about sexuality and sexual issues because I think we all stand to benefit when we can overcome our hesitation and reach out to one another if, if the need arises and support one another as we try to maintain uh, successful sexual functioning throughout our life cycle. Sexual dysfunctions in older adults uh, have historically been categorized in three different categories, desire disorders, arousal excitement disorders, and orgasm disorders. And so we'll speak a little bit about some of the disorders that fall within those three categories. I'm also going to include some guidelines for discussing sex with someone. And when I talk to students, uh, I find that this is really important for them to hear and to understand. But lately, I've begun to feel that all adults might benefit from this information. So I think when, when you think that you may have a friend or loved one who's struggling with some aspect of their sexual quality of life, the guidelines to keep in mind, if you would like to speak to them about this, include establishing rapport. So you want to make sure that there's a comfort between the two of you. You want to take responsibility to introduce this topic because I think, uh, especially when a clinician is involved, I think the patient or client will hesitate to bring this up. 
Uh, so, but even if you're not a clinician, if you're a friend, uh, it still may be helpful for you to take the initiative to introduce the topic. Of course, ensuring privacy is important, allowing sufficient time is important. You know, in my field, we talk about this thing called door knobbers, and that's the term we use to describe the topic that the patient brings up as they reach for the doorknob. And it's usually something they've been dreading to speak about and they've been putting off speaking about. And finally, at the final minute, they have the courage to bring it up. Of course, at that point, there's no time. And so psychiatrists get teased a lot about what we say, but one of the things we would say in that moment would be, well, that's a very interesting topic. Let's talk about that next time. But really, um, Truthfully, it's the right thing to say because you really can't do a good job speaking about such an important thing when you only have a few minutes left to have that discussion. So it's important to allow sufficient time. It's also important to use neutral statements because we really want to uh, avoid causing someone to feel judged or criticized. Uh, and also it's important that we don't make any types of assumptions and we'll talk a little bit more about that. In terms of maintaining sexual function in later life, some of the things uh, that we recommend include making sure that your hearing loss, if you've experienced hearing loss, is corrected. And that gets back to that key idea that communication is very important. Um, and to communicate, you have to hear what's being said and to hear it accurately. Um, it's important to have good dental hygiene for all sorts of reasons that are probably self-evident. It's important that we take care of our skin as we age, all of us experience changes in our skin. Our skin loses connective tissue. It becomes more delicate. It becomes more easily injured. And physical intimacy can put a lot of stress on our skin. There can be a lot of friction and things like that. So keeping your skin moist and well lubricated can really make a difference in terms of avoiding injury or discomfort uh, related to the skin. It's also important to avoid tobacco products, Sometimes it's important to learn and practice specific exercises that maintain the body and allow for more comfortable sexual experiences. For us guys, it's really important that we think about our bellies and maybe consider sit-ups sometimes uh, in order to make sure that our girth doesn't become too challenging when we want to be intimate with someone. It's also important that we think about things like pain or shortness of breath. Uh, if you're living with arthritis, that can be a challenge because some of the joints that are most often impacted by, by arthritis are also joints that are critical when we're having physical intimacy. But we, we know now that if you have an issue with arthritis, uh, taking a couple of Tylenol before intimacy can really make a big difference in reducing discomfort and increasing the quality of the sexual experience. Okay, it, I think the last uh, thing I'll, I'll mention in terms of maintaining sexual uh, function in later life includes putting aside unrealistic expectations and just really being comfortable with how your body has evolved and only expecting from your body what is realistic. Um, the last key point I want to make is that the presence of dementia often leads to decreased quality of sexual life. And we believe a major factor here is the idea that many of the dementia illnesses impact the ability for a person to know what they're thinking and feeling and then to express that clearly to another. So when we think about the role that dementia plays in uh, sexual experiences in later life, one of the big things that we worry about is that the dementia erodes communication and then the, that absence of communication makes it hard for there to be emotional intimacy and then that sets the stage for difficulty with physical intimacy. Well, there are a lot of myths uh, about sexuality in later life and I've listed some of them here on this slide. For instance, there's still this idea that older people are not interested in sex, that they do not have sex, that they're not able to have sex. There's an idea that uh, older folks don't need sex education or information about sex. Uh, and there's also an idea that perhaps sex should be avoided because it can be dangerous or even lethal. There also are myths that are similar when we think about people who are living with serious illness. 
So there's a lot of concern that if you have an illness that maybe you have lost your interest in sex or perhaps if you have an illness that you should be protected from sexual thoughts or activity due to potential harm. Well, the truth is there are very few medical conditions that prohibit sexual activity. An example would be a recent heart attack and most cardiologists will instruct individuals to refrain from sex during a period of a few weeks or a month following a heart attack. But the rule of thumb regarding heart disease and sexual experiences is that if you can climb three, fl three flights of stairs without chest pain, then you can safely engage in sexual activity. So when we think about sexuality in older individuals, it's often a subject of humor or it's often avoided. And I think that the humor or the avoidance arises out of discomfort, perhaps because it clashes with stereotypes, maybe it, it, it's a cause of emotional discomfort, or maybe there's a fear in younger people that speaking to older individuals about sex in some ways might be offensive. Uh, so we have to kind of get comfortable within ourselves in order for us to be able to really do a good job of speaking about sex with anyone, uh, particularly those who are older. With my young medical students, I understand that for them it's kind of like asking grandma or grandpa about sex. And that can be a little awkward. You can, you can be afraid that you're stepping out of line. But I tell them, if you can ask about bowel habits and bladder function, it's not that too far astray to include in that moment something about sexuality. And so when we do what's called the review of systems, which is usually a part of an initial visit with the doctor near the end where the doctor kind of starts at the head and goes to the toes, asking a series of questions to get an overview of one's health, I think that's a very logical time for questions about sexual function to be asked, particularly when you're uh, asking about bowel or bladder function. I also like to remind uh, everyone that, you know, as human beings, libido or sexual drive is hardwired in our, in our bodies. Just like thirst, hunger, the avoidance of pain, and the desire to have attachment with other human beings is hardwired, so is libido. And aging does not necessarily undo that wiring. Who gets older and loses their appetite for food? I, I think most healthy older folks enjoy their meals. And I think the same is true for sexual experiences. Unfortunately, in general, late life sexuality has not frequently been depicted in media. And uh, sometimes if it is depicted, it's not depicted in a very fair and balanced way. And I think this tends to perpetuate some of the ignorance and some of the myths that exist about late life sexuality. However, there have been some recent notable exceptions that I'm very proud to mention. And some of you may have had an opportunity to see the movies that I've listed here on this slide. But uh, starting back in 2004, there was a movie called The Notebook that I think did a nice job of telling or showing the viewer that older individuals still value physical intimacy. Uh, then there was Away From Her. The cartoon movie Up, I thought was very poignant, but also emphasized that this older couple's uh, intimacy was still very important. Uh, most recently, some of you may have seen The Best Exotic Marigold Hotel, but one of the uh, taglines from this movie and a tagline included in, in the trailer for the film was Judy Dench, the character that she portrayed, asking a male friend, you're not worried about having sex at your age? And the male friend replies, if she dies, she dies. So I think that, that kind of uh, ex exposure in media can help educate the general public. Also, there's been a, a really nice book that was published in 09 by Barbara Rose Brooker called The Viagra Diaries. And this is a novel about sex and love after 60. It truly is meant to be a takeoff on the TV show that some of you may be familiar with called Sex and the City, but it's Sex and the City for seniors. Uh, and the main character, the protagonist, is a woman named Annie Applebaum, and she's single, and she's 70 years old, and she's writing a newspaper column about her search for love. 
And this is a picture of the cover of her book and the picture of the author. When this book was released, it got quite a bit of media coverage. And th this is an article that appeared in the uh, San Diego Union Tribune uh, shortly after the book was published. And when I saw this article and read through it, what really struck me was a passage that I want to read aloud. Uh, but it, she talks about how difficult she, what a difficult time she had getting this book published. Um, and she said, it wasn't an easy thing. Everyone wanted, everyone wanted me to change Annie's age, she says, of the big publishing houses. They said, can't you make her 49 or 61? No one wants to read about a woman who is 70. Well, eventually she went with Lumina, a small press run by people she felt understood the importance of getting her story out. But I think her experience really drove home this concept that ageism is still a challenge in our society. And there are still a lot of people uh, who have ageistic beliefs that I think are kind of toxic. So what do we know about sexuality in later life based on some of the research that's been done? Well, we started way back 20 years ago by putting things in perspective and looking at research from what are called traditional societies or traditional cultures. We wondered, uh, outside of the influence of Western civilization, uh, what was happening uh, in terms of sexual behavior in later life. And we came upon a very comprehensive uh, compilation or review uh, published back in 1982 that summarized literally dozens and dozens of anthropological scientific studies. And when they did this summary and focused in on sexual activity, they found that in 70% of the traditional societies that were studied, there were reports of sexual activity in males of very old age, sometimes beyond the age of 100. And 84% of these societies reported sexual activity and interest in older females. In general, the data from this uh, review showed that uh, sex was viewed neutrally, that sexual interest remained high, particularly in women in later life, and there was some speculation about possibly a connection with lessening of inhibitions and lessening in terms of fears of uh, conception. Uh, and also, there were reports of activity between older and younger people. Well, switching gears then and looking at studies of sexuality in, in the United States, we came upon 10 studies that we felt were worthy of our attention based on the sample size being very large or relatively large, and also based on the fact that the methodology employed we felt was sound, so that the results being reported were trustworthy. And so uh, the next couple of slides just list the studies that I'm going to be summarizing for you this evening. And you can see that many of them had fairly impressive sample sizes, you know, 1,700, 1,200, uh, a few of them uh, only about 200 uh, participants. But those of you who know anything about clinical research, even 200 is a pretty respectable sample size. Well, one of these studies was published in 2010 by Schick et al. And um, I want to just spotlight this study. Uh, one of the things that's really been helpful lately in this field of research is that the definition of sexual activity has been updated and revised. And so if you are interested in learning more about this independently, I advise you to be very careful about the date of the publications that you're referencing. Because there was a time not that long ago when the definition of sexual activity was unfortunately very narrow. And really, they were defining sexual intimacy only as intercourse or coitus. And now there's a belief that those studies really underestimated sexual frequency because we know that physical intimacy is much more than just intercourse or coitus. There are all sorts of things that people do that are physically intimate and pleasurable that don't involve penetration. So this study used a definition of sexual activity as any mutually voluntary activity with another person that involves sexual contact whether or not intercourse or orgasm occurs. So that was a very liberal and what is now believed to be good definition of sexual activity. However, this study has been criticized because something's missing. 
and that's masturbation. So even this study, which overall was well reviewed, uh, uh, has been criticized by omitting solo sexual experiences. Uh, they looked at um, sexual uh, experiences and they defined being sexually active as someone who had sex with at least one partner in the previous 12 months. And what they found was that 20 to 30 percent of both men and women remained sexually active into their 80s. Age was related to a lower likelihood of solo and most partnered sexual behaviors. When controlling for age, relationship status and health were significant predictors of select sexual behaviors. Some of that's pretty self-evident. If you're coupled, it's going to be a lot easier to have sexual experiences. The other thing that surfaced, though, was that if you self-report being healthy, that correlates with uh, increased sexual activity and increased quality of sexual activity. Now, I guess that's kind of self-evident as well. For men, health status was related to the men's evaluation of the experience, and for women, relationship status was the most significant predictor of a woman's evaluation of the experience. Schick and all found in their work that most men uh, over 50 do have sex with the partner, but almost 22.5 reported that their most recent sex was with a friend or a new acquaintance. For women over 50, 13.5% reported that their most recent sex was with a friend or new acquaintance. And this also got a lot of attention in the media because quickly the newspaper started writing about friends with benefits being a phenomenon not just unique to young folks, but also now finding its way into older groups of individuals. And a, a sociologist up at the University of Washington, Pepper Schwartz, wrote about what this might mean. And, and according to her, her thoughts are that the friends with benefit phenomenon kind of makes sense for young people because young people nowadays want to delay starting their lives. You know, we've extended adolescence now. Some people think adolescence goes to the mid-20s. So, you know, by the time folks get their education and get settled, uh, they may be um, uh, in their uh, mid-20s or beyond, and then they're uh, uh, ready to settle down and start having a relationship. For older people, the issue is maybe not wanting to complicate their lives, particularly if that older person is widowed or divorced, then starting a, a, a committed long-term relationship can sometimes be kind of complicated. And one of the complications that some of you may have some experience with is the role that adult children play in that moment and how they feel about what's happening. And some adult children are very supportive and some adult children become very apprehensive they worry about losing contact with their parent, or they worry about the impact of this new relationship on things very pragmatic, like their inheritance. So I think sometimes uh, when you're older, it's easier uh, to avoid those complications, uh, and at least Pepper Schwartz believes that's one reason why friends with benefits might make sense for older individuals. Conversely, however, people in the middle part of their life are building their lives and need more than a friend. They need a lifetime partner. And boy, I get that, especially with the career. I just marvel at how I could possibly do all the other things one needs to do to get by in the world and still have my career. So I think for me, practically speaking, it's really nice to have someone I'm partnered to because then I don't have to worry about the bills and the cooking and all of those other things the instrumental activities of daily living uh, I share, and that makes my life work better and more easily. Well, so here's how the media responded to the, uh, the research report. Uh, and they played up that the boomers rediscover the sexual revolution, and re they reported the study finding over 50 set having more casual encounters called friends with benefits. Well, I want to switch gears and talk a little bit about another study by a colleague named Lindau, uh, who also spent some time uh, analyzing uh, data that included information about sexual behavior in older individuals. And uh, one of her uh, concepts was to introduce this idea, sexually active life expectancy, which uh, was a term she used to describe the average rem remaining years of sexual activity. 
What she found was that uh, sexual activity and good quality sexual life, as well as interest in sex, were higher for men than for women, and that with aging, the gender gap widened. She also found, as others have, a positive association between quality of sexual experience and frequency of sexual experience with health. The healthier you are, the better your sex and the more frequent your sex. Um, and then also, she found that sexual uh, activity, sexually active life expectancy was longer for men, but men lost more years of sexually active life as a result of poor health than women did. In an earlier study by Lindau, um, she also had some other interesting findings to report. Um, again, using a more modern definition of sexual activity and defining uh, sexual be being sexually active as at least one uh, experience with a partner in the previous 12 months. And in this work, uh, one of the things that Lindau uh, wanted to do was to get a sense of the prevalence or how frequent sexual activity was. And what you can see here reported by age bracket is uh, frequency of sex. So in the 57 to 64 year uh, bracket, 73% of this sample reported at least one sexual experience in the preceding 12 months. And as the age brackets increased, the frequency drops, but you can still see in the 75 to 85 year old bracket, 26% uh, of this sample reported sexual activity uh, defined as at least one experience in the preceding uh, 12 months. Interestingly, and what was somewhat distressing for me to see in this report, was that the prevalence of discussing sex with a physician since age 50 was pretty abysmal. And so basically what the survey said, the question was, since you were 50 years of age, has any of your medical team asked you about your sex life? And what you can see here is for men, 38% had been asked, and for women, only 22% had been asked. So I think this, uh, I reframe this as, we've got room for improvement here. We can only go up from here. In terms of the problems being reported in the sample that Lindau studied, for women, the biggest issue that they reported was a problem with low desire, but they also acknowledged issues with vaginal lubrication and uh, difficulty achieving climax. And for men, the biggest issue for them in terms of sexual function was erectile problems, uh, but they also reported some issues with performance anxiety and climaxing too quickly. Now this is one thing that actually gets better for men with age. Uh, premature ejaculation actually improves with age. Lindau found that 14% of the men in her study reported using medications or supplements to improve sexual function and found that if you rated your health as poor, you were less likely to be sexually active, and if you were sexually active, you were more likely to report sexual problems. So there's a message emerging here. If, if there weren't already enough reasons for us to take care of ourselves and to be physically fit and physically healthy, we now can add to the list that it will translate into a better sex life as we age. Older adults and HIV. You know, I showed you those statistics about how often people who are over 50 are being asked about their sex life. Part of my dismay relates to the HIV issue in our society. Because I think what we've done well is we've educated people that condoms are a great way to prevent conception. They're a great form of birth control. But what we haven't done a very good job of communicating to the general public is that condom use is more than just a way to prevent conception. It's actually a very excellent way to prevent transmission of sexually transmitted diseases like HIV or gonorrhea or syphilis or chlamydia. And so what we're seeing is that one of the groups with the most rapidly rising rate of new infection with HIV are folks who are 50 and older. And I think the only way that we're going to turn this around is to overcome our embarrassment or our hesitation to talk to our older patients about sex and to find out are they sexually active, 
who is their partner, and then if they are sexually active uh, and it's not in a committed relationship and a closed relationship, we really need to be educating them about the importance of using condoms. When we look at uh, who these folks are who are older and uh, being infected with HIV, for women, 82% of the data from 2010, which was collected from the 46 states that collect this data, reported their exposure was through heterosexual contact. So I think uh, th there are a lot of folks out there uh, at risk. And, and for men over 50, 23% was heterosexual contact. So uh, you know, historically, we've tended to think about HIV impacting gay men and uh, people who use uh, injectable drugs of abuse. But I think that's all changing now. And we're seeing that this HIV issue is, is entering other risk groups as well, or impacting other groups as well. So more statistics here I'm going to kind of skip over. I think I've pretty much made my point uh, that, that age does not protect from HIV infection, particularly, particularly if you're not taking uh, steps to protect yourself. When we looked at how common condoms are used in individuals over 50, um, the data is pretty discouraging. Uh, one of the more recent studies found that when men were asked the percent of the past 10 vaginal intercourse acts that included condom use, only 5.1% of the men acknowledged condom use. And for women, it was 7.4. And I've been asked, how could this discrepancy exist? And I can't answer that. Uh, I don't know. Maybe women have better memory? Uh, I, I, I don't know. Because it does seem a little bit odd. Um, and then this just depicts the same data in a graphic form, which makes it just much more, I think, easy to see what's happening. Along the x-axis, you see age brackets. And then along the y-axis, you see percent of condom use in the 10, past 10 vaginal intercourse acts. And it just drops off dramatically with each successive age bracket. Well, the good news is there's now a public uh, campaign that I'm really pleased about. Uh, and it's, um, it's a campaign called safersexforseniors.org. And uh, what you see here are different uh, positions from the Kama Sutra. The tagline is, there are many ways to do it. There is only one way to do it safely. So in sum, then, when we look at these studies uh, in healthy older individuals, what we can conclude is that frequency declines, sexual responses slower, athleticism of sexual experiences decreases. But what does not decrease is the satisfaction and enjoyment that older individuals attach to whatever form of physical intimacy they are participating in. We believe that sexual dysfunction is not a normal part of life, but is a common result of pathological aging. And regardless of age, we know that uh, sexual dysfunction can be treated. But again, to have that treatment, it has to be discovered by a clinician who has the knowledge to offer a treatment that could be helpful. Available data suggests that older men are more sexually active than older women. However, we have to be careful about this finding because there is this concern that it might have been biased. Because as I mentioned in some of the older research, the definition of sexual activity was probably uh, not as broad as it, as it should have been. We know that level of sexual activity when young predicts what's happening when one is older. And we know that older adults infrequently use condoms but should use them regularly to provide protection from the transmission of sexually transmitted diseases. Maintenance of satisfaction in a woman depends on, in part, her perception of her general health, continued participation in sex, and the presence of emotional intimacy. And in men, what has surfaced in the research is that also perception of general health plays a major role. But for men, another factor is the perception of his sexual partner's attractiveness. And I do struggle with that a little bit. Um, it feels like, as guys, we're a little bit more superficial. I'm not so proud of that. But maybe it's something to do with evolution. I don't know. Maybe, maybe it's not just um, weak or, or bad character. Um, 
Well, I've mentioned quite a bit that intimacy plays a role in satisfying sexual experiences, and we know that the ingredients necessary to have intimacy includes knowing what one thinks and feels, the knowing uh, how to say that and being willing to say that to another, and then the capacity to perceive the meaning of verbal and nonverbal communication. And I, I put this slide in because I think it becomes pretty evident then if an individual is living with a cognitive illness that's eroding one or more of their cognitive abilities, then achieving intimacy can be very negatively impacted because they may experience deficits in language or self-awareness that really makes it difficult for them to achieve the ingredients necessary for uh, emotional intimacy to be present. As I mentioned in my nine key points, uh, these are believed to be some of the key ingredients for a satisfying sexual relationship, and the ingredients include safety, comfort, and attraction, feeling secure and positive about the relationship, having a positive self-image, including feeling comfortable with one's body and one's sexuality, adequate general communication, uh, both in terms of achievement of emotional and intellectual intimacy, and then specifically, adequate communication about sex. Well, how do you talk to someone about sex? I've adapted these slides. Uh, sometimes I share these with medical students, but I think all of us should be aware of what we understand to be uh, key ingredients to have successful conversations about sex with friends or family members. Um, rapport is important, so you want to make sure this is someone that you know, not someone that you just met the other day. Uh, you want to try and introduce the topic by putting it into some kind of context. Um, you just don't want to bring it up out of the blue. Uh, and you may uh, need to accept that the first few times that you try to address this with a friend or family member, you may feel uncomfortable. Um, but I've tried, I've tried hard not to let my discomfort inhibit me. I do blush easily, and I just have to blush and, and push forward. Um, I also know that, especially as a physician, it's important that I not wait for the individual who's come to see me for care to bring this topic up. They may believe that I consider sexual problems trivial or unimportant. And if I'm working with a couple in whom one of them is, is living with dementia, then the healthy partner may believe that discussing his or her sexual problems portrays him or her as selfish or as an inadequate caregiver. And so they may feel like, gosh, I shouldn't be worried about this. I'm the lucky one, right? I'm the one who has a healthy brain. Um, and so they may be reluctant to uh, be in the spotlight. It's good to begin with neutral, unemotional statements, like have you experienced any changes in your sexual life? And this is important because, as I mentioned a moment ago, there's a wide spectrum of libido that's considered normal. And for some individuals, uh, they've always had a lower libido, and it's never been a problem for them. Others are on the other side of the spectrum and actually have gone through their adult life with a fairly high libido. Well, what research shows is that what was happening for you in youth is maintained through your life. The reason we suggest this type of question and focus on change is because it doesn't uh, have any kind of implied judgment in the question. What we don't want to say is something like, are you still doing it? Because then, what do you say? If you say no, then you may feel like you're saying something wrong. Or you might even feel like you're saying something wrong if you say yes, right? So you want to say, is there a change? And that way, if the person used to have a high libido and it's dropped, they can say, yes, there's been a change. But if this person has always had a low libido and it's still the same place, they can say, no, everything's OK, and they won't feel judged or criticized uh, by the question. It's important that we use open-ended questions. It's important that we establish privacy in a comfortable environment. And as I mentioned, this should not be a doorknobber. This should not be something that you bring up at the very end of the time that you have to be with this person. Um, it's important that we not make assumptions. Um, for instance, we don't want to necessarily assume that the person is strictly heterosexual. Um, we, if we don't ask well about sex in general, we do even less well asking about sexual orientation. Uh, and it's also important that we don't assume that there's a sexual problem. We know that older adults may not perceive 
the absence of coitus as a problem. So we don't want to assume that that is uh, necessarily the case. It's important to determine a person's desire for sexual intimacy and also what their current sexual activity level is. And, and we're looking for a mismatch. Uh, it's important to ask about recent sexual experiences. It's important to explore things within that person's sociocultural and psychological context. And it's important, especially those of us who are in the medical field, to remember that medical problems and medications are frequently a cause of sexual dysfunction. Well, what happens that's normal to our bodies as we age that Im impacts sexual function? Um, well, we know that uh, as we age, for men and women, there is decreased testosterone production. And we know that with that decrease, uh, we can see decrease in libido for both men and women. Um, we know that uh, for men, in terms of genitals, we, we have fewer and less functional sperm, we have decreased penile blood flow, and we have decreased penile smooth muscle relaxation. And it's smooth muscle relaxation that allows uh, the penis to become erect. For women, we know that um, they have cessation of ovulation, of course, with menopause. They have decreased pelvic blood supply and some changes in their vagina, including shortening and narrowing. Also, the mucosa or lining of the vagina can become thin, um, and the vagina can lose elasticity and muscle tone. In terms of fertility and how age impacts that, of course, we know that uh, as men get older, they're not as fertile, and we know that when women are postmenopausal, uh, they're no longer able to conceive. We know that uh, because of that decrease in testosterone in men and women, there can be a decrease in libido. Uh, we know in terms of the sexual experience that arousal uh, will require more tactile stimulation for men and women. We know that um, erections take longer and vaginal swelling can be diminished. Um, we also know that for women, they can have decreased vaginal, uh, vaginal lubrication, which is something that's really important to ask about and, uh, and talk about because it's something that's pretty easily remedied. Um, we also know that with uh, age, some women experience decreased sensitivity of the clitoris. We know that orgasm takes longer to achieve. For men, ejaculation is less forceful. For women, they have fewer and less forceful vaginal contractions, and men have a decrease in their volume of ejaculate. And the refractory period for both men and women lengthens. That's the period before one can, again, become sexually aroused and have another sexual experience. This slide just lists some of the many illnesses that we know can have an impact on sexual experiences at any age, uh, but, but also, of course, in later life. Diseases of the endocrine system can affect sexual uh, function, like diabetes and hypothyroidism. Various other problems of the reproductive system, including various forms of cancer, can have an impact on sexual function and quality of sexual life when one is older. Diseases of the central nervous system can impact sexual experiences at any age, including later life. And of course, one of the biggest issues and one of the most important reasons that we all should have the opportunity to speak to our clinicians about our sexual life is the impact that medications may be having. Because unfortunately, many medications have the potential to negatively impact sexual experience. And I won't go over all of them, but you can see some of these medicines are very common, like tajoxin for people who have congestive heart failure, uh, uh, people who have high blood pressure and on a, are on ACE inhibitors. You know, ACE inhibitors are really believed to be the most senior friendly of all of the anti-hypertensive medications available. And yet, unfortunately, if you don't get the cough from ACE inhibitors, you may end up with some sexual dysfunction, which is not really uh, the outcome that we're shooting for. A lot of the medications prescribed by doctors like me in the field of psychiatry are really bad actors in terms of causing sexual issues in older individuals. Uh, in fact, I'm looking at this slide and wondering what class of psychiatric medication isn't represented here. And the answer is they're all represented. Every potential class of psychiatric medication uh, has a potential to negatively impact uh, sexual function. 
other medications and substances can impact sexual function. Even things like alcohol has to be factored in to the discussion. And of course, diphenhydramine or Benadryl, which is the common ingredient in most over-the-counter sleep aids, can have a big impact on sexual function. Problems with desire can be related to disfigurement, um, can be related to illnesses like depression, uh, can be a side effect. The serotonin selective reuptake inhibitors have a famous uh, reputation for decreasing sexual desire. The most famous antidepressant in this family is Prozac, but now there are many others that have uh, been introduced, including Zoloft and Paxil and uh, Celexa and Lexapro. Um, all of them have the potential to negatively impact uh, sexual desire. Um, and we know that dementia uh, can be an issue in terms of decreasing sexual desire. Uh, we sometimes hear spouses of people with dementia talking about the change in the personality of their loved one. And so they're still very devoted to their spouse, but that spouse isn't the person that they've known throughout their, their marital life. And they feel like uh, in some ways it's a stranger. And it's, it's that issue then that erodes the arousal and libido because it's like, I don't know who this person is anymore. Um, we know also, as I mentioned, that testosterone reductions can be associated with decreased desire. Um, in men, we know that testosterone reductions can be associated with erectile dysfunction and infertility, and in women, associated with impaired arousal and decreased genital sensitivity. And in both genders, decreased testosterone can lower libido, decrease muscle strength, be associated with things like depression, lethargy, inability to concentrate, breast discomfort, mild anemia, hot flushes, and sweats. There are issues um, involving the arousal phase of the sexual experience. Uh, the phosphodiesterase inhibitors, including Viagra, have made a big impact here uh, in terms of helping men with this issue. We still don't have a consensus on whether the phosphodiesterase inhibitors have any value for women, although there's been some research into this. The findings remain mixed. Uh, but what we can uh, offer women is solutions like lubrication to deal with vaginal dryness, which can contribute to painful sexual intercourse, uh, but yet with appropriate use of lubricant that improves. I mentioned that one of the good things that happens in terms of our sexual functioning with age is that for men, the frequency of premature ejaculation decreases. Um, we do see some issues with anorgasmia uh, or the inability to achieve an orgasm, uh, but many of those uh, uh, causes, uh, if they're identified, can be uh, corrected. Um, so how do we maintain sexual function? Well, it's important to eat a heart-healthy diet. Um, just like all the other organs in our body depend on adequate blood flow to maintain their health and function, so do our genitals. So if you want a healthy brain, a healthy heart, healthy kidneys, healthy genitals, it's all about taking care of your blood vessels. And that means a heart healthy diet, uh, getting adequate rest, getting high blood pressure taken care of, getting diabetes well cared for, because all of those illnesses, high blood pressure, diabetes, smoking, obesity, uh, excessive lipids in your bloodstream, all of those things have been associated with injury to our blood vessels. And when those small blood vessels get injured and clogged and no longer adequately deliver blood to the organs that depend on them, uh, then those organs begin to fail. And so uh, it's really important that we keep in mind uh, that we should uh, live a life that maintains healthy blood vessels. Um, it's important to have good dental health. I mentioned taking care of your skin, avoiding tobacco products. Alcohol is another issue. I mentioned uh, diphenhydramine or Benadryl. Alcohol can also have a huge impact on things like achieving an erection or achieving orgasm. Um, so we want to be careful about alcohol intake. Uh, regular exercise is important and correcting hearing loss. Sometimes we need to teach patients certain exercises. I mentioned abdominal girth can be an issue for men that can compromise the quality of their sexual life. Um, also for women, they can have issues with uh, the pelvic floor 
and the muscles that create the pelvic floor, which sometimes unfortunately are injured by things like childbirth. Um, but you can do Kegel exercises and you can recover some of that muscle strength and muscle tone. It's important to obtain optimal care for medical illnesses. As I mentioned uh, in my uh, earlier uh, comments, pre-treating things like pain from arthritis or shortness of breath from COPD or congestive heart failure can make a big difference. If you ha live with COPD or congestive heart failure, uh, using your puffer uh, before sexual activity can really help open up your lungs and maintain your breathing at a level that makes sexual experiences much more enjoyable. Um, I've mentioned several times the importance of lubrication, particularly in women, um, and then also we've touched on the role that medications can play, and we have to uh, try to avoid medications that diminish sexual function. Well, I'm going to switch gears, uh, and I know I'm just about out of time, but I thought I would touch briefly on how sexuality and dementia uh, impact one another. This is a quote from one of my favorite uh, books that's been written. This was written by a couple of social workers from the Duke University Alzheimer's Disease Research Center. In this book, there's a quote uh, that I have here that says, in the absence of a cure, the most significant thing we can do is adapt our approaches with each change in symptoms to make life as meaningful and satisfying as possible. And that's a pretty liberal view, uh, but for those of you who've been touched by the dementia illness or know someone who's uh, uh, impacted by dementia, I think you'll understand where this quote is coming from. And I think this quote was originally written with the patient with the cognitive illness in mind, but I think this quote applies to both members of the relationship. Because at least with Alzheimer's, we know that's a 12 to 15 year illness. And if you're a healthy 65 year old, um, it may or may not be comfortable to think that for the next 15 years, you uh, will not have the level of sexual quality of life that you would have otherwise have wanted. Some of the research been, that's been done regarding the impact of Alzheimer's on sexual performance, not much, but there was a study back in 1990, uh, a modest study that found that erectile dysfunction was uh, pretty common. About half of this sample size reported erectile dysfunction around the time of their diagnosis with Alzheimer's. Um, in terms of what's happening in these couples, uh, most spousal caregivers report that the impact of the dementia on their sexual life was negative. 79% um, reported a change, and of those who reported a change, 92% said that it was an, in a negative direction. About 8% actually said that things had gotten better. Um, another kind of worrisome thing that emerged in our lit review is that we're not asking uh, spouses when they come to see healthcare professionals about the effects of dementia on their marital or sexual relationship. Uh, some more data all kind of in the same, uh, pointing in the same direction. Uh, interestingly, 39% of sexually inactive caregivers in this study reported that they weren't happy about the inactivity. Uh, if we kind of compile all these studies together, we would conclude that erectile dysfunction is a relatively common uh, problem at the onset of dementia, that uh, the presence of dementia usually impacts the sexual relationship in a negative way. The research varies between 70 to 79 percent of samples reporting negative impact on sexual experience. However, some couples do continue a warm and satisfying sexual relationship. And looking at three studies, the range was 20 to 27 percent with a mean of 23. So about a quarter of the couples impacted by dementia illness actually are able to hang on to uh, a, a sexual life that's satisfactory. Um, we know that a significant number of sexually inactive caregivers aren't happy about that inactivity, but we know that there's no one right answer. And sometimes uh, it's, it's all that's necessary is the person being able to say that they're unhappy. They're not going to do anything differently. You know, many couples uh, take their marital vows quite seriously, and it just is not even on the radar that they would do anything other than remain loyal to their spouse. There are occasionally people who don't see it quite like that. Um, but it's not my job to tell someone what to do. It's my job to let them speak about their values and come to a decision that makes sense for him or her. 
uh, even if it's not exactly what I would have decided for myself. Um, unfortunately, in general, healthcare professionals don't ask about quality of sexual life uh, in general, and we certainly don't do it very well when we're helping couples in, uh, who are living with dementia. So I think what our job is as caregivers uh, involved with people living with dementia is to assess the behavior, assume that there's a valid need to be met, to really see the behavior as a form of communication that may or may not really be a uh, communication about sex, although we often jump to that conclusion. You know, when an older individual with dementia tugs at their crotch, that might be a nonverbal cue that they need to go to the bathroom. And yet I sometimes see a lot of hysterical responses in that moment. And I have to educate people that it, it may not be uh, that they're wanting to be lewd, they're just trying to communicate in the best way that they can. Um, it's important that once we do figure out what that need is, whether it's sexual or not, that we act to meet that need effectively, appropriately, and in a dignified way. And I think all of this applies both equally to uh, family members as well as professional caregivers. And I think family members are sometimes going to be uh, more approachable than the doctor. And I think that's why it's important that we touch on this a little bit this evening. As I mentioned, touching genitals may indicate uh, the need to toilet. Um, you know, another thing that I get called about is this issue that occurs in senior communities where an older individual with dementia climbs into bed with another patient. And often that really isn't at all an act of sexual aggression. I think what's most often the case is that they're just seeking familiarity. I don't know about all of you, but for the past almost 19 years, I've shared my bed with someone. When I travel to a meeting and I sleep alone, I don't sleep as well. It feels weird. It doesn't feel like what I'm used to. So if you've been married for 50 or 60 years and suddenly you're living apart from your spouse and sleeping in a twin bed, it can feel kind of weird. And so I think a lot of our older individuals with dementia who are living in residential care are just seeking out what they're used to. And we have to educate uh, the patients and the families and the staff uh, not to overreact to that and to try and approach that in a very compassionate way. So nursing homes and residential facilities are an odd place for people uh, to think about sex. Uh, it does change things and I think we've got some work to do in terms of educating people who own, operate, and work within these facilities. Um, sexual behavior in nursing home differs in significant ways from such behaviors at home. It is no longer a private matter, but in one way or another has an impact on staff, other residents, and the families of residents. So I'm going to sum up. Um, sexual experiences for older people are common, enjoyable, and helpful. For many, especially women, emotional intimacy may be needed for an optimal sexual experience. We know that there are other conditions that contribute to a satisfying sexual relationship, including safety, comfort, attraction, feeling secure and positive about the relationship, a positive self-image, and adequate communication. We know that there's a broad spectrum of preferences and adaptations, that there's no one right answer for everyone, especially if a partner has dementia. Mm -hmm. For healthcare professionals and perhaps for friends and loved ones as well, our most important responsibilities, in my opinion, are to introduce the topic and to facilitate supportive, open dialogue. I've included some guidelines for discussing sex with someone, including waiting until there's a sufficient amount of rapport established, taking responsibility to introduce the topic, ensuring privacy, allowing sufficient time, using neutral statements and not making assumptions. We know that sexual dysfunction in older adults can be categorized in three ways, desire disorders, arousal excitement disorders, and orgasm disorders. We know that there are things that can be done to maintain sexual function in later life, including correcting hearing loss, maintaining good dental hygiene, taking care of your skin, avoiding tobacco products, learning and performing specific exercises, pre-treating pain or shortness of breath, and putting aside unrealistic expectations. We also know that the presence of dementia leads to decreased quality of sexual life in most couples, in part, I believe, due to problems maintaining intimacy and safety. Thank you very much.